can record to this computer. I will upload this onto YouTube, by the way. So if you're just be aware of that, if you're uncomfortable with that, let me know, but this will go on YouTube. I don't monetize anything on YouTube, so there's no ads on anything on YouTube. I use YouTube because I am, because Google has a vested interest in making sure that YouTube is super accessible uh, on basically every single platform. Am I cutting in and out? Okay, time for me to move. Give me one sec. All right, so my kid will be moving out of this room in just a second, so ignore the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse as best you can for a second. Yeah, yeah, they are going to be, I, I don't think they're going to be learning great, great things from Mickey, if we do Mickey Mouse. So, what's the mystery mouse tool? <laughs> Keep it on, they say. Yeah, the show is actually fairly entertaining. So, <laughs> great. All right, so, welcome to the class. Um, so, I am Professor Rosen. I teach CIS 1051. I teach also 2168. Uh, I am currently at home, which will lead to some entertainment, I am sure, at some various points, uh, because I have a three and a half year old who is very socially starved. Um, so, anyway. Hopefully this internet connection is better. Um, I just don't, I am using my built-in camera and microphone right now because I, I figured I might have to move. So um, anyway, uh, I'm sure many of you have questions about this class. Um, so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the syllabus. I'm going to go over how this class is going to run, um, which is going to run slightly differently this first week than every other week, um, as well as um, just what kind of resources and tools are available for, uh, for you. So you, first thing you may have noticed is like wondering, wait, why aren't, isn't there a textbook for this class? Or you may have looked on the Temple Bookstore and been wondering where the textbook is. Uh, the textbook is free, it's online. I know that some, for some of you, maybe using a, a textbook is a bit difficult if it's not printed, but I'm hoping that the fact that it's free and has some really good built-in tools uh, will help with that. I'm also trying to make sure that basically everything is accessible as possible on Canvas. So um, without further ado, I'm going to basically give a, a demo of what's on Canvas and what you should pay attention to, okay? Because I try to keep things as fairly organized. There's just a lot of various things that I have on Canvas. So that can get a bit overwhelming and I want it to get become a bit less whelming. All right. so. This, so um, here is the course web page, right? Um, so this class is intended for people who have some or no programming experience. Uh, there's a lot of people, a lot of people are not computer science majors in this course. And um, this class caters to, to them. This class also caters to people who are planning on taking a lot more computer science courses. Um, so I plan on using the same link throughout the entire semester to join. Um, currently, I have it set up so you don't have to log into Temple to join. Uh, I do understand this is prone to abuse in the fact in what you might call Zoom bombing. So I will keep it open for right now. But if somebody decides to be very disruptive um, in my lecture and sign in under an alias and basically just disrupt the lecture, then I will just simply switch to enforcing that you need to log in, which just makes it adds in a small hassle to everybody. But for right now, just to make it easy to, I, I make it so you don't have to really sign in to anything. Okay. But this is the link you'll use for my lectures and my labs. Your lectures are on Tuesday and Thursday at two o'clock. Um, on the, and then you will have a lab. 
some sections have lab on Monday. Some have sections have, some of them have uh, labs on Friday. It's just the way it is. I don't like that because, you know, you have your uh, lecture, you have the lab before the lecture sometimes, but it will work itself out. The way courses will work starting next week, sorry, the way the general things will work starting next week because the Monday will be missing next week is that I'll give lectures on Tuesday. There will be lecture, lecture, Tuesday and Thursday, and then the associated lab on the Friday and Monday following that. So um, that Monday will kind of be ha ha uh, lagging behind in a way, but it won't really matter for due dates. Um, if you need to contact me by phone for some reason, I did list my phone number in a very, which seems slightly foolish, but hey. Um, next, uh, office hours. So um, there's two ways of scheduling office hours. First, I have uh, set office hours each week, which you can create by, which you can reserve a 15 minute slot just by clicking on one of these links, putting in your name and why you wanna meet with me and I will meet you at that time. Generally, they're from six to eight on Monday and then I've got Tuesday and Thursday mornings uh, open for you. Um, if neither of those times, if these times don't work for you, um, or you want, or somebody scheduled a slot that you really needed, you can just simply send me an email and I will arrange to meet with you for a different time because, you know, maybe nine o'clock in the morning doesn't really work if your time zone is in California, you know? So that's why, so send me an out, uh, a link. I will meet with you pretty much any time you need. Uh, with him, you know, if that is the only time you can meet. Um, the required course materials is a book called Foundations of Python Programming. It's made by a lot of people. Um, hmm. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the um, thanks for the feed feedback on whether or not you can hear me or not. So. Uh, I will be, I mean, but that's part of the reason I'm recording. I don't know why it's necessarily uh, having issues. So, um, so anyway, with the, here's how you get into the textbook. What you want to do is click here. And this is uh, the website for the textbook. It's completely free. You create a username and a password to sign. What you want to do is you want to sign up, create a username, put in your real name so that I hear for first name and last name so I can actually figure out uh, who, um, you know, uh, who I'm supposed to assign the grade to, essentially. Um, and then for the course name, you'll want to put in this code fall 2020 Rosen. All right. And then that will log you into the textbook. Uh, we will be utilizing the textbook for an in-class um, exercise on Thursday. Um, but the textbook is one of the things that you'll be do uh, you will be using a lot because it has a lot of nifty features, such as being able to run code and watch how co a code runs. Um, if Zoom continues to have problems, by the way, for everybody, I will I can always transition to using Google Meet. Um, which basically works the same way. I send you a link and you click on it. Um, but, but yeah, Zoom has been having issues. Ostensibly, they are okay right now, but ostensibly. Um, next, other links. Discord invite, right? We have a Discord. The class has a Discord. Uh, this is a invite. Click on it. It's essentially a giant chat room for uh, students have, for all the students who are currently taking my classes. So um, it's a great resource to get help and get your questions answered. Um, I will also typically respond very quickly on Discord, um, as opposed to email, which I check only a couple times a day. And the reason just happens to be it's like the difference between a chat message and an email. Chat messages are just feel a lot faster and a lot more fluid to respond to. Plus, I can always respond with a GIF. So, you know, there's that. Um, next is my YouTube channel, um, which I don't need you to like me or subscribe me or, or donate to my Patreon. You know, this is again, simply for your convenience. I upload it there because YouTube I know works. Um, and finally GitHub where you'll, uh, GitHub is something you should become familiar with as we go on. 
Uh, but basically, all the code I will write will go into this ITP, intro to Python, folder. Um, so I will give you a, so all the code will go into that folder and you'll be able to find the code there and it will get updated. Um, here's your TAs with your, with the respective se uh, sections. So, um, and the respective Zoom links. I still have to fill out some of the stuff because, you know, TAs had to figure out what their office hours are based on their schedules and their commitments, but um, they all are very good TAs. Um, as far as, and if you haven't, gotten the message yet um only only tomorrow's sections one and three are have an in-person component to them and you can either attend them in person or you can attend them via the zoom link either or so you can do this uh course without actually ever having to set foot in a classroom if you so choose um i'll be remaining off campus um unless completely and utterly necessary um there and because i I've done online classes quite a bit and I know how to run them and I am completely convinced in my ability to help you if you need, if you need it uh, online. Um, I'm actually, um, the big thing you should know is that if you are struggling in this class or if you have extenuating circumstances, the sooner you let me know, the sooner I can help you. I am very, I will get into the demoing process. Um, so I am very, very um, flexible when it comes to difficulties students have. But the sooner you tell me about any difficulties, uh, the sooner I can help. Um, the syllabus over here. Yeah, I don't know why it goes from a list to just collapsing like that. Those are just dates to, you know, your typical drop ad dates and stuff like that. Um, anyway, so let's go ahead and check out the syllabus for a second. Let's do, do. I'm just gonna make sure I'm seeing what you, you're seeing. All right, so, ah, yeah, bit too sensitive there. Okay, page width, there we go. All right, so again, classes are gonna be held virtually. The next thing is that my intention is, th is for this to be a flipped class. So I should have all of next week's material posted by tonight, that is my goal. Um, I will try to make sure that there is at least a week ahead of stuff because I wanna make sure um, polished. But the idea here is that you are going to watch, is that this class will not be conducted like your typical college class. Uh, the idea, he, and now, and before you think I'm too crazy, I should let you know that I have been flipping my, um, my, my data structures class, uh, the 2168 class for about two years now. And the students have reported that it is one of the best experiences they've had in computer science. So the idea here is that it is flipped. That means you will, watch lectures slash read materials each week before coming to the virtual sessions. The virtual lecture time is instead now devoted to those kinds of things that you would be doing outside of class. In other words, your homework. So the idea here is that the vast majority of your homework, rather than having to be slaved on outside of class, should be worked on in here, in the lecture. Should be worked on in the um, and should be worked on in the lab. So that's basically the way it will, uh, I plan on having it work. Um, the idea is that we are moving the mentally complex material closer to when the time when you're when I'm most accessible and moving the stuff that's easier like your first exposure to material when you are when I am further away from you. Okay. So uh, labs are virtually so turning in your homework. Um, specifically the um, there are certain exercises that will say need to be demoed. To do that, that's a two-part process. You submit your homework by uploading the appropriate file to Canvas. It's judged late based on the day it's submitted and not demoed. And then demo it, you just show it to us during lab or office hours or after the lecture. And that's how you get a grade for it. Um, do not tell me I did not know we need to demo our assignment to receive the course. I will give you an automatic zero in the course if you do so. That is like the only way to receive an automatic zero in the course um, by saying, I did not know we need to demo our assignments to receive credit. Because if you couldn't read this first page of instructions for how the class is run, like I can understand like, oh, this is a giant document. I don't want to read the whole thing. But I've got this thing called executive summary over here. 
so you should read it. But, um, but not reading directions can have very lethal consequences in programming once you're building stuff that can, you know, affect the real world and break. Um, so again, here's the, uh, the textbook link. And if you're in an in-person lab, you need to wear a mask. Uh, otherwise, we will just simply suspend the lab and, you know, not continue with it because I'm not going to put other class members and my TA at risk. Um, um, you know, maybe, and I don't know, maybe you should wear your mask to, to these online lectures just so your computer doesn't get a virus, you know, just, just saying. What? No laughs? Um, you can, yeah, you demo it to uh, either the, uh, you demo it to either me or to the TA. All right. Um, you found the you found the place in um, here. Here's the listing for these. Bell Building is the tech center. That's right by the College of Science and Technology, right? Then you go to the, then right next to the College of Science and Technology is the underpass that leads to the trains and the commuter lounge. Right next to that is a bunch of, you know, restaurant stalls. And right next to that is the College of Science, sorry, is the tech center, the Bell Building. So that's where those labs are, okay? Um, and as you probably heard, once we hit uh, November, we stop. Um, basically, it's everything is remote. So, um, a laptop is strongly recommended. Um, if you cannot afford a computer or have issues with that, please let me know as soon as possible. Please let me know about what kind of situation you're in so I can help accommodate you as quickly as possible. Uh, a, I have an entire document I've been working on that basically here are recommendations for cheap computers. Um, you need, you, I highly recommend headphones um, for chatting with me. You definitely, you don't need a webcam, that's what they say, but, and this is the recommended speeds for, um, for, for your internet. I suggest testing your connection at fast.com, which hits net, Netflix's server, okay? Um, but the vast majority of this will be on Canvas. Um, again, here is the textbook. Um, but if you need additional references, especially hardcover stuff, um, first off, these two documents are, again, completely free online. Automate the Boring Stuff with Python is, is made, uh, is directed towards people who are, who basically are self-teaching themselves in computer science and, or programming and don't want to, you know, and, and basically don't need, aren't really necessarily taking a course. It's really good. A hard copy is like 20 to 30 bucks, but again, it's all for free online. Same thing with Alan Downey. He runs Green, uh, Green Tea Press, and he's very big on basically killing the textbook industry that charges like $200 for a textbook. Um, so uh, he wrote Think Python, How to Think Like a Computer Science. It is a very concise text. I think it's okay. It's definitely free. Um, and again, if you want it in paper, it's 20, 30. These are not things like that I say you need to buy them. You should not have to purchase anything for this class. Um, these are just simply additional kind of resources if you want additional reading. And then Python itself has its own tutorial and documentation. Um, I expect you to be here because, you know, you signed up for a course, but otherwise um, attendance, which I will take in a bit, uh, is basically going to be a component of this course just simply for contact tracing purposes. Why online? I don't know, but I'm required to do it, so I'm going to do it. Um, even in person, even if we were running this class in person, I normally would be, um, I normally would say, if you're sick, don't come to class. Watch the recording. If you're sick, don't worry about the quizzing class. I, you will can make it up. Mm -hmm. So it's very, it's, you know, it is very important that basically that you stay healthy, even in regular times. Um, and I have always recorded all my lectures and posted them online so that you can view them. You can even view those, some of the lectures from previous semesters. All right. Um, that being said, if you're in a weird zo uh, time zone, just tell me. Um, if you are, get, if you get super stressed, 
significant stress. Don't we all experience significant stress like right now? Um, changes in mood. Uh, yeah, that's check. Problems eating or sleeping. I know. But anyway, let me know. Don't feel free to reach out to me. I'm not a professional counselor, but I will listen to you and I will try to basically accommodate you as best you can by adjusting whatever deadlines there are or pointing you to whatever uh, actual services there are available online. You know, I will basically, if you're having issues with, uh, with basically keeping up with the material, let me know. The sooner you let me know, the more I can help you. If you need to meet with, uh, if you have a disability, let me know and I will uh, help you with, and, and I will, sorry, if you have a disability, let DRS know and let me know what accommodations you need and I will work to make that uh, happen for you. Okay, uh, so the grading for this course is, normally this course has like a heavy exam component and I, from previous semesters, I found that just doesn't really work as well, uh, or rather from last semester, I found that doesn't work as well. So I'm trying com something completely different. You have five compo components for this, uh, for this, um, you have five components for this. So you have your solo exercises, you have your active learning e exercises, final project, quizzes, and exam. So solo exercises, those are basically the textbook exercises. The big thing there is that basically you do some exercises on the textbook, um, they're linked in the module. So generally like, uh, say if we go over to the modules, each module will correspond roughly to a week probably. Um, and that will be one or two chapters in the book. The chapters are quite short. Um, it will tell, and if you go to the overview, it will tell you, hey, watch the videos in the next few pages. Here's the reading that you need to do. Um, here's the assignments that are gonna be, that we're assigning this week and all what the things we're gonna do in class. Um, if you click on the reading, let me go ahead and sign into my runestone so you can see what, what, what you would see. So Prof Rosen, hit log in, right? So here is the main course. Here's the like projects that are listed in the book. And here's all the, the chapters and sub chapters in the book, the big table of contents. To get to your, assign, uh, your textbook assignments, which will be linked elsewhere, you just click on your little icon here and hit assignments. And typically your assignments are just basically readings and uh, basically in class, uh, in exercises. Now, I'm not like one of those jerks who make you basically get it for the right the first time, right? Because a lot of these have to be programmed and mistakes happen in programming. So um, you're graded on the best attempt. Uh, for these. So you're basically given unlimited attempts on these, um, on these assignment, on these uh, kind of exercises. Um, and you're just graded on what you, um, on basically making sure you get it right. Um, this is just to make sure that you're, this 10% this of your grade is to make sure you're just following uh, along. The active learning exercises are your traditional homeworks and labs. They are any project problem or assignment that we're going to introduce in the lecture or the lab. Solo exercises are just gonna be listed on Canvas. Active learning exercises basically are, the, we are either gonna start them and completely finish them in the lecture or lab, or you're going to get a good chunk of them done. Uh, they're going to be supervised. I'm generally going to have a live or recorded walkthrough associated with it, um, or, or maybe the trickier parts of it. Um, and then the big part of these is that here with the solo exercises, you can get help, you can work with other students, but I don't think you'll need to. Whereas here, I highly encourage you collaborate with your, your fellow students. Most importantly, you've got, a, you've got a demo to receive credit for the stuff that's specifically listed as lab assignments. And again, to do that, you finish it during the lab, you demo it, you, you demo it with the TA there, or you meet with me after the lecture or you schedule with office hours. Um, the project one, so I see in the chat, I saw the project one active learning exercise, but I don't know how to do it. That's for, uh, that project one active learning exercise will be done in class Thursday. So don't worry about it until Thursday. That is something that I am literally going to walk through with everybody on Thursday because it's a preview of what's to come in this class. Um, 
finally, the, we are going to have a final project, which is going to be a first for this. Um, this is going to be basically, you're going to learn a bunch of stuff. And I typically find I have plenty of extra time. And then I figure, what the heck am I going to do? Well, this time I have an idea. I'm going to make you build something. Uh, you can pretty much use any language that you want, as long as you let me know. Uh, you can build what you want. Again, you've got to submit a proposal for it. Um, so I'll pretty much say yes to almost anything. All we really ask is that it's either interesting to you, it solves an actual problem, you impact the campus, or not an and, or that you change the world. Some of those four things. It's interesting to you, you could solve a problem, it could, it could help campus, or it makes a small change to the world to make it a, small, a better place. The idea here, though, is to make something to, that either outlives the course or looks good in a portfolio that you might be creating. Um, this is definite. So I encourage like group people to work together, but especially in the pro a final project. Um, but the more people in a group, I would expect the more uh, more work uh, to be done in in that. Um, but the big thing here is that I allow and encourage you to double dip for your final project. So if you have a final project in another class, I have no problem with that being the same final project in this course so long as you get approval from both me and the other professor who's doing the final project. So if you have multiple projects and you see, oh, I could merge these two projects and ostensibly do the same project for both classes, so long as you let me and the other professor know and we both give approval, then I, I will, um, sorry, I saw a uh, comment in the chat. I will address that in a second. Okay, multiple people have that question apparently. So what it means to demo is to, um, I realize, yeah, I did not explain that. Okay, so to demo, what that involves is basically you submit your code. That's your first step. The second step is either meet with me or the TA or any of the TAs, in fact, just because you're in your section doesn't mean you have to meet with your specific TA, but arrange the demo with the TA. And the demo process means you show us your code, you run it, you let us know it works, and you walk through it and I will ask you some basic questions basically to make sure that you understand what you did, that if you work with somebody else on this, that basically you just didn't simply copy what they said wholesale and without understanding it. I want you, I, basically this is your, this is effectively showing your work. Now this may be nerve wracking for you the first time, um, but that's part of the reason I do this. Um, in computer science interviews, it is very frequent that you have to write code and then explain it as you're doing it. But also, if you can explain it, then you certainly will, it will certainly help you understand it. Um, it is not meant to be a painful process. If you are stumbling over your words and can't really deal, it, uh, deal with it at the moment, I will tell you, go away and just come back again when you're ready to demo it. So it's not really, there, you, you are not gonna, it's, you're not gonna be graded necessarily on how well you demo it or how poorly you demo it. It's either you could explain it or you didn't explain it and you come back again later when you can. Okay. Um, part of this is that it acts as a basic plagiarism. Uh, Sorry, question? Oh, kind of a, yeah. Question? Yeah, it's kind of like that. See. All right. So, the, but the, again, it acts as a basic plagiarism uh, check. Next, uh, it makes sure that you actually understand what you wrote and also it gives you the skills you need to help explain your code. Um, there is not a specific deadline for your uh, assignments. We do want to see them demoed within a month. Uh, but now, since we're all meeting online, I figure it's going to be very easy to meet. Um, but, um, but generally the rough guidelines within a month. If you have a good excuse for why you haven't demoed it within a month of it being submitted, I'll probably let you demo it. Any other questions as to regards with the demoing process? If there are, I'll uh, ask them in the chat, but otherwise I'm gonna move. Um, if, the, if what you demo doesn't work, yes, you can resubmit it. In fact, one of the big things about the demoing process is that 
sometimes there is that often we see students have a minor misunderstanding of 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 what we of what we intended and so we can tell them and then you can fix it and and they can fix it like right there and then that's the correction and yes you can schedule the demo uh, for office hours or you can just send me an email if the time doesn't work or you can send your TA email or you can demo after the lecture uh, yes, you can demo more than one lab if you have them done. Okay. And yes, you can demo during your lab time. You can demo during the lab, the lecture, uh, after the lecture, or during office hours. All right. Quizzes and exams. So first, I'm going to say, I'm going to mention that uh, I have no plans to do an exam, which is proctored ass assessments. But I might change my mind depending on, on whether or not the, how I'm doing this course crashes and burns. Right? right now, I don't plan on doing traditional high stakes, high stress exams, okay? Uh, quizzes are short assessments. They're not always gonna be equal. Uh, some might be worth 100 points. Some, some might be worth, um, worth uh, 15. I have no plans to use Proctorio, which probably will make me like really popular. So um, the idea here is that quizzes are, and exams are open book. You can use anything that, and anything and everything that is not human. So the only humans you can ask for help on your quizzes is the TAs and me. Quizzes are basically taken on your own time. Basically, they have a due date, which by, and you want to start it before that due date. And once you start the so say it has so say you've got an, uh, a quiz that has a due date of Sunday. Okay, that means that you have to take the quiz before Sunday. That quiz also will have a time limit, say like a half an hour. That means that basically the time limit is a half an hour, but it is, as you'll explain, a soft time limit. Okay, so because I, because I, uh, things can and will go wrong when you're programming. Final exam, that will be a standard high stakes examination, just simply because that is the departmental policy. Um, however, again, probably no proctorio. Generally, what ha how that will, the way that will work is that everybody logs on to a simultaneous Zoom session while I'm proctoring. I won't ask to see your screens or anything like that. The main purpose of me proctoring is so that I'm there to answer questions. Make sense? That being said, don't think you can really get away with cheating. Uh, I should mention that it is not uncommon for, it is not an uncommon assignment for computer science students to write plagiarism detectors. Plagiarism is, detecting plagiarism is all about pattern matching and you better believe that uh, computer science, uh, com computer scientists are good at detecting patterns. So, my late penalties. I am very good about late pe penalties. So, the late penalty is that you will, that Every day that an assignment is late is uh, five points per day late. Maximum penalty of 50 points. That means that worst case scenario, if you decide to basically spend the first month playing MMORPGs um, and suddenly realize maybe I should take this a bit more seriously, you can still turn in that basic stuff uh, for half credit, okay? In general, we're lenient about late assignments. If you can get them to us, um, we, that's really what we care about. Quizzes and your final project milestones have a different late policy. They are going to be penalized. And again, the final project won't be something you worry about until later in the semester. Um, the the uh, late quizzes will be penalized at a rate of a, a tenth of a percent per minute over the due date on Canvas or the time limit. So say you have a half an hour to do a quiz, but you take 40 minutes to do it. Your score will be penalized by 1%. If you, if you have a half an hour to do it and you take an hour and a half, you will be penalized 6%. Okay, and then if you take, for some reason, 16 hours, your score will be penalized by, uh, you know, it'll be nulled. So, you know, actually, you know, there has to be some, at some point where it's not gonna be worth anything. So in general, we're pretty strict about late exams and quizzes and project stuff. 
Uh, but if like you tell me I can't take it today because um, like my house has been flooded, you know, I'll be reasonable. Okay, just again with quizzes and stuff, let me know. Okay, um, I'm adopting a lot of these things come from C uh, Harvard CS50, which is um, their intro class. Um, I like a lot of their policies and I'm trying them out to see how they're going to work, including that late policy over here. Um, and the idea here is that I just want to be reasonable. Um, be sure, read through this. But basically, there are here are what basically are things that I are sorry, well, let me just say in essence, all non group assignments and exams should be your. Uh, your own. Collaborating on homework is encouraged, but that doesn't mean that somebody should do your homework for you. That being said, I think the best way to learn something is to teach it to somebody else. So you should work. And so here's one of the things that I think are reasonable. Communicating with people about assignment in English or some other language. Discussing the course material with other people, such as on Discord. Helping some, uh, some pasting your code on Discord and asking somebody for for, uh, to help you find a bug. Um, taking a few lines of code you found online, uh, provided that they are not the solution to the problem and that you cite where it came from. I'm big on citation. I will forgive a lot if it's cited. Um, sending or showing code that you've written to somebody so that they can help you fix a bug. Okay, so sending your code to somebody else so that you can, so that you're getting help. Sharing a few lines of other, uh, with other, other people. Um, turning the web uh, to find other references. So long as they're not just solutions to this problem. Uh, working on problems in a whiteboard or, pseudo, uh, or pseudocode, or even getting a tutor to help you with this. Provided the tutor does not do your work for you. Um, that's an excellent question, Katrina. So Katrina asked, how exactly would we go about citing something with our own code? And, and the way that works in computer science and programming is that parts of programs have something called a comment. So a comment basically is a line that the computer can't read, but humans can. And in Python, it is preceded by the hash mark. Um, I don't see why it wouldn't be, I don't see why that uh, MIT link wouldn't be useful. Um, so things that are not reasonable. Asking, uh, getting a solution, getting a direct solution just online. Uh, basically breaking down some code that somebody else did, seeing somebody else's problem and then using it to, uh, before you submit your own. Failing to cite where you found something online. Uh, giving somebody your your solve problems so that they can solve it themselves, so that they can, um, when they are the one who is struggling, so you giving your code to somebody else so that they can complete it. No. Paying somebody to solve your work for you. Definitely not. Posting on, um, on, on Chegg to ask for the solutions. Definitely not. Looking on Chegg for those solutions. No. Um, pretending somebody else's work is yours. No. And submitting somebody else's work, uh, basically like changing just a couple lines, just one line here and a line there. No. So, um, I, I hope that's clarifying. When in doubt, don't, but you can always ask me. Um, and if for some reason you violate it, let, and let me know within uh, 72 hours. I will, um, I will let you, I, I will be a bit more reasonable about that. Um, can you post your code on a site like Reddit for help? Definitely. You can definitely post your code for help. The main thing is that basically, if you are asking for help with your code, you generally, uh, you are allowed to share the particular bit of code you are uh, the particular bit you're having help with. If you, on the other hand, are basically saying, hey, here's my complete solution, have fun with it, this is how I solved it, that's not how you, um, that's not what you want to do. All right. Questions about the way the course is going to run in general. 
by the way, you have rights over here. You should probably figure them out. One of the rights is that you are not, is that if you have more than two finals scheduled for the same day, you're allowed to ask one of the professors to move. You should not be able, you should not take more than one, uh, two finals in the same day. So keep that in well, uh, sorry, keep that in mind. Was that final rule last, was that final rule used last year as well? It's always been, it's always been a rule. I'm really sad that I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I am quite sure. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things that generally, you know, it's possible to have conflicts. So if there's a conflict, generally let me know. You know, as long as you keep me apprised of like any conflicts or obligations you have, I will be reasonable about it. Okay. Um, you know, this, this semester is crazy enough without me having to add uh, stress to you. I, I, I understand that some of you have jobs. You're working. It's not, I am, I, do, I shouldn't exist here to make life more difficult for you. I'm supposed to help you learn this content and I can't, and hungry people don't learn well, stressed out people don't learn well. All right, with that being said, this being a science course, I do not let you go just because I'm done with the syllabus. So instead I'm going to give you a basic overview of, um, of what computer science is and isn't, as well as um, some his historical information about computer science. But before I do that, I just want to know any questions, because I got to pull up a PDF now, an old PDF that's probably slightly out of date, but I'm going to use it anyway because I like it. I mean, there is a group chat. There, the the Discord. Use, you can use the Discord um, and that's there. So everybody can ask for help and I'm there. And believe it or not, I am also on Reddit. So, although I check my, um, my, you know, my, one of my users' names is Andrew underscore Rosen, but it is, but that's the one I use uh, quote unquote officially. So let's see. Not all the socials. I am, I, I haven't touched Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat. I, I did not have a MySpace, no. All right. So let's see, I'm just pulling up the one here. Let's see, old, come on, there it is. I knew I would find it. All right, so I will go ahead and share my screen again. Okay, all right, so First thing we gotta, we gotta sort out here is what in the world is computer science? Because um, you might, a, a, the, instinctive, uh, the instinctive answer you might have is, oh, it's about computers, right? We're studying computers. And um, th these two fellows, Michael R. Fellows, <laughs> and Ian Parbury, uh, basically wrote this statement saying, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescope, biology about microscopes, chemistry about beakers and test tubes. It's not about the tools, it's about how we use them and what we do. In fact, computer science in other countries is called informatics, not computer science. It's not about the, stu uh, the study of computers. Um, it has actually, the theory of it actually has very little to do with computers. It's not the study of programming either. It's an understandable misconception because we get you into computer science by programming and our first uh, computer science class is often introduction to programming and pro well actually technically if you look at, at our title it is introduction to problem solving and programming I mean and you know this misconception though is perfectly understandable and there's a misconception I had when I started um, it isn't also about learning programming language because computer science and the various fields of it existed long before formal uh, programming languages 
uh, showed up. Um, by the time you get your degree, if you're getting a degree in computer science or ISNT, uh, you will be able to pick up new pro uh, programming languages in a couple of weeks because a lot of the features basically map from one to another. Um, we don't study specific software. We will come up with uh, software to build and formalize it. Um, so um, here, what it is, is a bit of a debate. But there's a couple of what I'll say a not wrong answer. And I would say that the not wrong answer for what computer science is, is computer science is the study of algorithms. Um, it is a science of how we automate problem solving. So it is an extremely, um, I like computer science a whole lot because it's an extremely general field of study that is applicable to basically any field of science you wanna go into. So anybody who wants to go into the sciences, that's perfectly fine. Somebody says, I'm still confused, uh, confused about algorithm program. I haven't defined them yet. That's perfectly fine. Um, but computer science studies how we can automate problem solving. It asks really what, you're done eating the crackers laser? And now he leaves the bedroom. <laughs> All right, it asks, what can we do? Uh, what right when we get down to it can be automated? My son's name is Laser, L-A-Z-E-R. It is short for Eliezer. <laughs> um, so there's a wide variety of topics that are covered by theoretical computer science. Um, you've got algorithms, data structures, computational complexity, in other words, how tough are problems, figuring out how to distribute problems, uh, figuring out how to do uh, calcu uh, calculations, quantum computing, which I don't even know where to begin, hiding information, um, figuring out what exactly mathematically a computer is. A computational biology is big, really big these days, using computer science to solve biology programs, using computer science to model economics, using, uh, using computer science to model geometry. It is a very big field. So, Computer science studies algorithms, which I have yet to define, to determine if they're correct and efficient. It designs and builds systems that can ex uh, to execute these algorithms. Um, it design you design there's designing programming languages, and then there's figuring out what are important problems to solve. So you can do a lot of things with computer science. Um, you can Go study biology, chemistry, and medicine. Uh, so do things like figure uh, out to work on uh, algorithms that take samples uh, from people and, uh, and try to detect cancer. You can try to detect, uh, create new medicine with, with these. You can, one of the things that uh, that's a common thing brought up is HIV inhibitors. So basically make sure the, uh, the HIV um, does not infect people nearly as well. Here's a very, um, very easy one to kind of see, which is prosthetics. In other words, figuring out, you know, basically how do I replace missing human parts with machines? Okay, um, physics and astronomy are a big one. Uh, supernova detection, pretty much all supernovas that are detected in the sky are detected by automatic algorithms these days. Um, there's tons of astronomy data, the large synoptic survey telescope. I don't know when that was supposed to be able to come online, but it will get 140 terabytes a day. That's a lot. Um, all high-speed training on, the, on, on uh, the stock market these days is run by computers. Pretty much any trading is done automatically by computers these days. Very few people actually like figure, oh, I'm going to figure out how to trade something this amount and because it's gonna go up and I'm gonna predict that. Yeah, no, uh, you detect a small dip in the, a small fluctuation in the market and then you exploit it. Or you, you look and you see, oh, there's a cycle in the, in the currency in converting. So if I convert from dollars to yen to, to, um, to, some other, uh, to some other money and then go to another currency and go back to dollars, I'll end up with maybe a bit more money than I started with. And so I'm going to run that as many times as I can until, until, until everybody else catches on. 
No, you cannot learn how to hack the stock market in this class. <laughs> um, psychology, the entire field dedicated to psychology in computer science called human computer interaction. That's actually where I got my start in research. And it's about how do people use computers? Where should we put the taskbar? Where should we put stuff on windows? What colors should we use for our documents? Why is, is lighting the screen in blue a terrible idea? Those kind of things. Um, how do you make it so that blind people can use computers? Um, education. Why can't I say blue is terrible for night vision? So basically lighting your entire screen up with blue makes it very um, it makes it hard to makes it hard to use. It's part of the reason why uh, why uh, it's better to have it's better to use a uh, red light in the evening because that your that doesn't hit your night vision as hard. If you want to blind someone in the evening, you shine something that has a high high amount of blue in the light. So, um, and this is not even getting into the fact that software engineering, networking, security, data analysis is are big parts of uh, things you can do with computer science. So what is an algorithm? The word algorithm comes from the Latin name of Mohammed Ibn Musa al-Khorizmi. He, um, and I don't know if I pronounced that completely correctly, but uh, his name was Latinized to algorithmity. Um, he wrote a textbook in the year 820 called The Concise Book of Calculation by Reduction. Um, that, is the, that is algebra from algebra, meaning reduction. So we get algebra from him. Um, so you can blame him for that, I guess. Um, so um, let's see, let me go ahead and paste his name so that I can get his Wikipedia article to come up. Control C. Let's see if that comes up. Yay, hey, it worked. Right, so he was a Persian mathematician. Very, very famous. Um, but anyway, one of his big things was that he worked with these newfangled uh, numbers coming right out of India that worked in a base 10 uh, base 10 system. So, I mean, mathematics basically is one of those things that has a huge um, history. And computer science is, a, is just a part of that history. Um, but anyway, he worked in this new Indian decimal system. It was translated to Latin in the 1100s, and then it spread to Europe from there. So we get algorithm from his Latinized name. So what is an algorithm? Um, you did algorithms in mathematics, by the way. Anytime you did multiplication or, 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 or addition by hand, that was an algorithm, right? So let me go ahead and pull up a whiteboard. Let's see. So let's go ahead and press back. And I guess a blackboard. So let's go ahead and just review addition for a second, right? I don't know what this chat board. is. What? Can only see the PDF still? Um, I'm covering it up because I'm about to go over a very a basic algorithm that you all understand, that if you understand. So let's go ahead and see. Um, oh, I need to set it. So settings, active pen off because I don't have my pen on me. So, excuse me. Ugh, wait a second. Did I seriously not have my pen? Oh, okay. I'm going to just have to do it ugly in, in Notepad. All right, please keep it, you know, reasonable in chat. Please, like, try to reserve chat for questions as best you can. All right, so let's go ahead and say we've got uh, 620, uh, 627 plus, uh, plus 583, right? So we want to add these two numbers together, right? The algorithm, and there's an algorithm for doing that. Let me go ahead and increase the size so that you can actually see what's going on, right? The algorithm that goes on, that's, that, that we use is that we take the ones place, right? 
And then we add those numbers together. You can't see my notepad? Actually, we can still uh, see the PDF. Interesting. One second. Screen one. Boom. Should you? Can you see that? Can you see my PDF right now? No. Yeah. Now we got it. And the notepad. Okay. Weird. I must have been sharing the PDF instead of the entire screen. I normally share the entire screen. Okay. So the way addition works, right? If you remember your algorithm from that you probably learned uh, that you probably learned forever ago is that you add, you take your you take the lowest place the ones place and you add the numbers together let's go ahead and add them together 7 plus 3 is i think that's 10 yeah that's 10 pretty sure and so that becomes 0 or rather it becomes 10 with sorry it becomes 0 with carry the 1 so we carry the 1 over here and then we add the carry and and then the two numbers so 2 plus 8 plus 1 is 11. So, so that, so we put one down here, we carry the one, and now we do one plus six plus five. So six plus five is 11 plus one is 12. So we put two down here and we carry the one over here for a grand total of 1,210, right? That is an algorithm. It is basically a series of steps by steps that we do to um to fi figure out to figure out things this is I seriously not define what an ah here it is so what is an algorithm specifically it is a well-ordered unambiguous it is a set of well-ordered unambiguous operations which yield some result in a finite amount of time that is the um that is the big definition of an algorithm. So what does it mean to be, and most, the probably though the most familiar uh, algorithm you can probably think of though, is a recipe. So an algorithm is a set of well-ordered. What does it mean to be well-ordered? Mathematically, that just means that there's a definite order in which things happen, right? One thing will occur before another, right? When we're doing addition, we add the ones places, uh, you know, we add the ones places before we do anything else. Okay, unambiguous operations. In other words, these are thi they, these occur in a specific order and they are unambiguous, meaning we there is no uh, ambiguity in the statement that we're making. Right? These directions can't be misinterpreted. Is the point? They yield some result. That means that basically it does something. It yields some result in a finite amount of time. It does something before the universe ends, right? It does, it's not gonna go on forever. The algorithm solves some problem in a finite amount of time. An algorithm is basically a set of instructions. The instructions are well-ordered and they are unambiguous. Aha, doesn't a program do the same thing? That is an excellent question. And the answer is yes. What is a program? A program is an implementation of an algorithm in a programming language. A program takes an algorithm and puts it in terms that a computer can understand because at the end of the day, the computer is just a rock that we tricked into thinking with lightning. So the idea here with an algorithm is that this is kind of like the informal way we, we describe things or maybe we determine it in, in what's called pseudocode, which might look like, uh, which might look like this. Euclid's algorithm to find the greatest common denominator. And then you perform these mathematical operations, right? But what is a program? A program, the same thing in a programming language might learn in Python might look like this. Mm -hmm. So, because at the end of the day, think about this for a second. Your computer, you've probably heard, runs on, on something called binary, with zeros and ones. There's multiple layers of abstraction that, that, happen, there, that happen there. So this gets into our next thing, which is what in, so um, there's these fundamental insights of computer of science that multiple people have. All information we can represent with zeros and ones. We can encode anything in zeros and ones that we need to. Any kind of discrete information we can 
put that into zeros and ones. So you can take numbers and put them into base two format. You can uh, take strings and letters and convert them into a sequence of zeros and ones. So you can represent zeros and ones basically by two any distinct, easily distinguishable states. So high and low voltage or on and off. Um, and why do we use zeros and ones? Because that was cheap and easy to make for electronics. Um, and then Alan Turing, who you may have heard of, um, made, uh, and if you haven't heard of him, he is often considered one of the fathers of computer science because, uh, due, to his con due to this big contribution. He, can, he figured out that you can write all these algorithms, and again, algorithms are these unambiguous, op, uh, unambiguous, well-ordered instructions. Okay, they can uh, they they can be carried out in this manner. Basically, imagine you have an infinitely strong strip of paper, and it's divided into squares. You have a device that moves back and forth and can do one of these. Sorry, you have this device that then can do. Uh, they can operate on these squares doing these five things, moving left, moving right, putting the zero at a current square, putting a one at the current square. Um, and, oh yes, it can erase a square. Sorry, there should be one more thing. It can be, that should be read the square. It doesn't, if it doesn't make sense, that doesn't, that's okay. Because this isn't something you typically learn until like a 4,000 level class that's completely optional. Um, then other people had the insight that basically we can take basically uh, languages and we can basically make programs out of three types of statements. Uh, sequential statements, basically do X, then do Y, then do Z, then do A, then do B, then do C. So just statements that are basically commands. Next, you have um, your conditional statements that say if X, then do Y or do Z. And then you have iterative statements where you repeat. So what does that mean? Um, well, essentially, we, event, we started out by programming in zero and ones, but that's complicated. And honestly, humans aren't built for that. Uh, later on, we, so we developed something called assembly. I have to put this PDF on Canvas. Um, we created something called assembly um, or assembly language, which were basically the small machine uh, instructions that we could code into machines. And from that, we developed two types of languages that your textbook will go, uh, go into. We've got these, uh, we've got these two different types of what are called high level languages, which are much easier for humans to interact with. You have compiled languages and interpreted languages. And your textbook goes into a good amount of detail on that. Um, but to summarize, a compiled language is basically where you pro is there where we program this thing in something that's easier for humans to read. And then the compiler takes the entire program at once, converts it into, a, into instructions your computer will understand, possibly even optimizing it for your computer along the way. An interpreted language like Python is, are typically more fluid, able to uh, do things with less, less effort on the user side, but slightly slower. But essentially you've got a program called an interpreter that runs and basically takes commands one at a time and translates them. Think of like an interpreter at the UN where basically somebody's speaking and then they've, every country has their own interpreter in translating it to their language. So a very brief history, so I'm gonna end this lecture with a very, very brief history of computer science and big things that happened in computer science. Um, the first computational device was an abacus. And that wasn't a computer, it just did data storage, but you know, it was a little thing with beads that you could move back and forth and it helped you basically do bigger and bigger calculations. During the 1600s and the 1800s, that is when basically there's, where basically, you know, the mechanical discoveries basically that brought forth ideas like we could make big machines that do big operations for us. So, and we could use the position of various gears in these machines to represent numbers like clockwork, right? So Pascal, Leibniz, Babbage, big names in, uh, in mathematics, but Babbage specifically, he wanted to create a gear-based machine, right? You want to make this machine made out of gears that would, you know, rotate and do the operations just using gears. Don't ask me how that wor would work. I'm not an engineer. Uh, but he wanted to basically make it so that whatever you did, rather than having to check the gears manually and figure that out, it would print it out on paper. 
So that brings us to the, to the first programmer, Ada Lovelace. Ada, uh, Ada uh, sorry, Augusta Ada King, Countess of Lovelace, the first programmer. She was the child, uh, and for those of you who did, took English, she was the child of um, Lord Byron, who basically ran, who was very, very famous in the literature circles of the time, and he was a very big celebrity. And uh, anyway, he was known as to be somewhat of a wild historical figure. Um, so much so that basically Ada, Ada's mother was like, um, yeah, so she's not going to do anything exciting. Math seems rather unexciting, so she's going to do that. And so her, her history is extremely interesting. But anyway, she's often credited as the first programmer. Um, her, and so she worked with Babbage, right? She, he designed this analytical engine, he called it. Designed it, but never was able to build it. Um, that would basically do these all these mathematical operations. And Ada published a paper and a program showing how you could and some notes showing how you could use this engine to compute what are called Bernoulli numbers, the specific sequence of numbers. But her biggest contribution was she wrote about how you could use a machine that just stores these numbers to do th uh, uh, operations on things other than numbers, which was about an idea about 100 years ahead of its time. Uh, the biggest jump of where computer science maybe started fracturing itself off from the field of mathematics was during World War II, which was the birth of modern cryptography. Uh, back then, basically, in, we weren't really using machines to encrypt information. Uh, so codes could be solved by hand by people, but after that, it was not really feasible. Um, any intelligence that came out of uh, out of cracking German ciphers was called ultra, and one of the leaders, uh, at least by the United States, uh, anything out of cracking the uh, the Japanese ciphers was called magic. If you had ultra magic clearance, you basically were kept very very safe during the war because you were a valuable asset, a code breaking asset. Alan Turing was one of the was one of the main one of the programmers in Bletchley Park. Um, the, his role in World War II was dramatized in the in the movie The Imitation Game. Although I should mention that he was a generally much more likable person than the movie portrayed him to be. Um, Eisenhower, uh, who was the supreme leader, uh, supreme Allied command leader, I can't forget his what the actual title was essentially a five-star general, said basically Ultra was decisive to an allied victory, shortened the war by two years, but the, the uh, Alan Turing built a machine called a BUM that basically worked on uh, automatically decrypting uh, intercepted German ciphers. Um, he then went on to be, to work on other, he also worked on other computer science related things such as uh, the Church-Turing thesis, which basically is a mathematical model for computer science. Um, unfortunately, he was, uh, unfortunately, Alan Turing uh, was killed for the crime of being gay at the wrong time, uh, which is that homosexuality was illegal in, in England at the time. He was uh, caught and he was given the choice of basically being imprisoned or go undergoing chemical castration, if memory restores me, uh, sorry, if memory um, serves me correctly. He chose chemical castration and then uh, committed suicide sometime afterwards. Um, Ada Lovelace also died at a very early age, I believe, of cancer. So um, that is two very important people in computer science who died very early on in their career. So moving on, the first computer. Can, uh, there is contentious as to what the first computer was. A famous early computer is ENIAC, this thingy. Um, and I would note that there are a lot of women in that picture who basically were hired to do a lot of work, moving things around. Women got especially involved in these kind of efforts because a lot of men were off uh, being drafted. So ENIAC, the Electronic Numerical Integration and Computer, Construction began in uh, 1943, completed in 1946, used vacuum tubes 
it was about 1800 square feet and it was primarily uh, for used for artillery calculation. Uh, the story since then is miniaturization. First personal computer that you could own introduced by IBM at, uh, in 1981 and nowadays you can store a computer in your pocket with more power than what you would use to um, to basically uh, figure out how to land something on the moon. Um, the internet is a, uh, so the big things in computer these days is the internet, basically the fact that all devices, all computational devices have a way of connecting with each other these days and using the World Wide Web, which is an application running on top of the internet, is the primary uh, application we use on the internet, which is basically anything with web pages. Other things run on the internet as well, but the web is so large that it literally requires other web pages called search engines to help you find stuff that you're looking for, right? And there's a lot of money in that, as you know, Google found out. Um, miniaturization of technology. Technology gets smaller and smaller. Let me show you my favorite piece of small technology. This freaking thing. This freaking thing is one of my favorite pieces of the small technology right over here, a Nintendo Switch. It is, um, and as of like this month, it can run Crisis, which is a game that required like a supercomputer, um, a, a, like a decade, literally a decade ago. Go. So, I mean, things get smaller and that is huge. And yes, I do have Smash. Um, so, um, but, but we can talk about that another time, not during class. So, um, the other big thing is that applications, with things getting smaller, applications also get bigger, such as you want to search every single document on the internet to do something, or you are going to take the entire uh, hundreds and hundreds of terabytes of text to try to teach a computer how to write the next lines of text. Mm -hmm. So, okay, uh, I'm primarily Ganondorf. So, uh, how to become a good programmer? You have to practice. Uh, and you might think, oh, you, there are people who are specifically, um, you know, suited to being a programmer. Or that, like, certain people can't be programmers. You can't be a programmer if you're, if you're not good at math. So, it is a whole lot of... I'm um, just BS in my opinion. The only way you become a good practor, pr programmer is the way you become a good musician. You practice. Nobody expects you to basically pick up an instrument and be able to play something awesome. Okay? It's, it's just not feasible. You practice to become a good programmer. And not only that, you're probably going to think I'm a terrible programmer for a while. I didn't think I was a good programmer until I think my last year of my PhD. There's a lot of, um, of what you'll find is imposter syndrome in, pro in programming. Please keep the game chat to the game channel in Discord, by the way. There's, I have a specific channel in the Discord ch uh, ch server specifically for um, talking about games. So, the um, best way to become a good programmer is by um, practicing. Uh, the, one of the key features of what I find a good programmer, though, is not being smart, not being intelligent. It's being a special sort of lazy. It's the kind of lazy where you're like, I'm going to do this so it's less work later on or I'm going to create a template for something so that I can just adjust it for when it comes up again. I'll rather do an hour of work now than a half an hour if that means when I have to do it again, I only have to do it for 10 minutes. Make sense? Right, it is a, it is, it is a, it is better to work, it is the whole, the good programmers are the ones that we thought, that we say works, um, work smarter, not harder. Those, that's the kind of, thing that I think makes a person a good programmer. 
um, but not necessarily say natural cunning or natural intelligence or being good at math at that kind of stuff. Um, it's people who are dedicated to practicing and honing their skills, they're the people who succeed the most. So um, during your first lab, if you haven't done it um, yet, your first lab will involve basically looking up a famous computer scientist who is not Bill Gates, who is not Steve Jobs, and who is not Alan Turing. And the reason I say you can't write about one of those three for your first assignment, your first lab assignment, which if, you're, if you haven't done it yet, that will be on Friday, is um, the reason you can't use those three is because if I didn't put a, a prohibition on one of those three, then that's, those are the only three people I would be reading about. Right, and it gets kind of boring. There's only so many uh, Steve Job facts you can read. Um, um, how do you find a famous computer scientist? I highly recommend Googling famous computer scientists and picking one of the many faces who come up. Um, so with that, it is 319. Um, if for some reason you need to leave class um, beforehand, uh, then do so. I think the, I did forget one last crucial thing, which is that we need to take attendance. So attendance works like this. I click on attendance. You go to Canvas. You click on attendance. Okay. Yada da 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 da. You're lo to loading your course enroll uh, enrollments. Steve Turing, Alan Jobs. All right. So here I click start check in. And then you go over here to your attendance page and click to check check in. You have 20 minutes to do so. Um, there is no penalty for not for not completing the attendance. You'll just get a e you'll just get an annoying email if, if you miss attendance. So if you get an annoying email, don't worry. All right. Otherwise, uh, class is dismissed. If you want to stay behind to ask any questions or to demo something, please stay behind. Professor Rosen, when you were talking about the compile language, is uh, this might be a silly question. It's not. I get easily confused. So is the compile language another way of saying a high level language? Because you said it goes yes. through the compile. Most okay. compiled, yeah, compiled languages are generally high level languages. Okay. Um, so compiled languages are like C and Java and C sharp. <laughs> There are languages that basically make use of a, a special program called a compiler. Um, your textbook will go over it uh, specifically. I can actually drop that in the chat right now, um, I believe. So let's see. So bu -bu -bu yeah, here it is section. It is section 1.3 in the textbook. Um, I will drop it in the chat as soon as I find where I put the chat. There you go. Okay, I'm going to just go ahead and broadcast it. That is the link. Hopefully you should be able to just simply click on that and use it. Okay. Uh, that will explain the difference between high level languages and low level languages, as well as interpreters and, uh, and compilers. Okay, oh. it's, the, it's not something you're really gonna be tested on. This is kind of just like a very broad, very quick overview. This, this is just basically just kind of background information that's useful to know. Mm -hmm. But there are no stupid questions because in a class this big, I guarantee if you have a question, 10 other people have it at the very least. Uh, professor, so uh, how much do you, know, do you know in what depth will we, will we be covering uh, quantum computing? I do not cover quantum computing. If you are interested in uh, quantum uh, computing, um, the algorithm, the textbook for 33, uh, 3223 um, uses the textbook um, Dasgupta's Algorithms, um, published in, I think, 2005. Chapter 10 goes over quantum computing. And if okay. you're wondering how I knew that, it's because Dasgupta's Algorithms is one of my favorite books as far as okay. computer science. It's like of the computer science textbook, it's the best because it's also reasonably priced at 50 bucks. Okay, and uh, one other thing, I will be, I'll, I will be sending you in the TA email about this. But I will Friday, September fourth, 
I won't be in town, so I won't be able to attend the lab. So will I be able to get everything on uh, yep. Canvas and everything? Totally. Totally. Okay. I, this class has to, this class, the way I plan on running the class is that basically it will account for any, if you, there's any kind of disruption to your normal schedule, then it's not, then it's completely recoverable. Okay. Thank you so much. I will see you on Thursday, I think. Sure. Um, professor? Yes. Um, I had a question about the solo exercises. Are those the, uh, are those the exercises that we find underneath the assignments tab or are those the ones that are located? Those the will content? be the, primarily those will be under the ones under the assignment exercises. I'll try to be better with my naming. I might rename some of the assignments to be, uh, to denote what they are, but they'll pretty much be just in the textbook. Okay, because I tried, because like are the ones on chapter one, the one that says 1.12, are those the ones that we have to have completed? Let's see. So let me click on assignment. Yeah, so over here, chapter one assignment. That's right. Right. I need, should rename that to module one solo exercises or something right. like that. Right. And if you know, and what is it? It um, is. On it, table of contents, the 1.112, if you go to that, like, because they're not the same questions as these. Are the, so as you do questions in the textbook, mm -hmm. as you go through the textbook and do the questions, it will check them off for you. Okay? Right. And these are the ones that, and these are the only ones that I care about in terms of, of grading. Okay, so the ones at the end that are after the glossary, like we won't be graded for those. No, okay. no. And in fact, a lot of them are like completely irrelevant. Okay, but, yeah. Uh, I tried going through them and a, a lot of them I, from yeah. that one chapter, I just didn't get yeah, don't worry about that. A lot of them, for some reason, are irrelevant. I don't quite understand why those problems are there, and that's the only complaint I have about this textbook. It, it, it put a lot of demo questions in the wrong place. I don't know why. Um, but mm. basically, for this assignment, you're going to do your reading, you do your uh, questions, and then you hit score me. Right. And that's how, and that's how you do it. Okay, um, good. And you'll notice that if I go to... Um, for Thursday, if I go to assignments and I go to project one active learning exercise, it just has this thing over here, mm -hmm. right? And say description confused, go to project one directly. You can also hit question in context and it will bring you to where you actually see the question. Okay, got it. But again, I plan on doing this in class as a, as a class exercise that everybody can work on. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. No worries. Mm -hmm. Um, Professor, could I demo the lab? Yep. Right well, I was going to ask that too. Yeah. Yep. So let me go ahead and see here. Let me see all the people I have here. Uh, is there anybody with questions or uh, does anybody specifically have questions left? Questions are easier uh, quicker to deal with than demoing and I can often knock out multiple people with it. Okay. Yes. I have a question real quick. So the demos, we just demo the stuff that we do in the lab and then the assignments on the assignments the website will be, or just homework, right? Yep. The assignments should be assignments and stuff we do in the lecture. My goal is to have them auto graded. Okay. So they will automatically grade themselves. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, professor? Yes. Uh, hi. So my question was, uh, do we do all the assignments uh, with uh, from our own, like our, by our own pace or like, is it by the lecture? Like, lecture it is by specifically lecture? what I set the assignments you need to do are specifically the ones I list here. Uh, under chapter one assignment and oh, so oh, anything I list under here okay. and but but as you go through the book and do them I encourage you to work on the additional ones but these are the ones specifically that I care about all right but say this is all stuff right. that okay. you already know like you've taken a python course some people will like mm -hmm. might want to skip ahead right if it's stuff they already know all right okay thank you so much no worries I had a yeah, question hi, professor. Oh, sorry yeah go ahead no go okay. ahead thank you is the uh, chapter one assignment the one that we should have done by lecture on Thursday? Yes. It yes. Says, okay. Due date. Yeah. I now the reason I don't have I have it due on Friday rather than like Wednesday is because the um, is because some people will join the class late due to people dropping and adding. Right. So I it's just to minimize a headache there. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And Rob, I believe you had a question. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, we uh, basically I did go to lab yesterday and uh, 
what we did was after the lab was over, we went over what we did. So basically I wasn't sure if that was part of the demo. Like we did show the TA um, what we did. Did you show the TA? Yeah, and we then, had- um, Then you, if you if you got a grade for it, then it, you demoed it. Oh, okay, no, uh, we didn't get a grade yet. It just says we did submit it, okay. but it doesn't, like I just if, checked, if you, it was, it's you, not graded yet. But. I, that would be something to address specifically with the TA. If they, if they de if you demoed, if you feel like you demoed it to them and should have gotten a grade, then just email them. I mean, the main purpose of the first assignment is just to make sure that Python's working and that you're, and that you can write print oh, okay. statements. Right, so that's really what we care about. Okay. Just basically, just mechanically, are you able to participate in the class? That is literally the purpose of the first lab. Got it. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, question, Professor Rosen. Um, so for a, the chapter one assignment, do you want us to do the little like test at the end of it, or? Um, let's see. So it's chapter so. Yeah, like I'm getting a lot of questions about this, and I probably have to make an announcement. So if I go to chapter one, right over here, blah, 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 where it says contributed exercises. Yeah. Yeah, ignore that. Ignore the contributed exercises completely. Okay. Because a lot of them are going to stuff like um, variables and while loops and other stuff. These are specific. I think he just simply specifically put stuff there. But you scroll to the bottom, it will say not part of the last reading assignment you visited. So it will tell you whether okay. or not it's relevant. The things I care about, that's what's listed in the assignment pages. I go through specifically just the stuff I care about and the stuff you should target. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, one second, I have a question please. Sure. Um, so for the first lab, it, for the Hello World lab, it says like if, uh, in part one, it says if you can successfully complete this task, have your program, then ask the user if they had heard of this person before. And I don't really understand what it's asking me to do. It's asking for uh, you to, you, to play around and try using the input statements like I did in the example on the PDF. Oh, the, okay. So the like this is like hand in hand with Yep, the input is how you ask the user to add it. So it's kind of the opposite of print. Print mm -hmm. says something. Input asks the user to say something. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, that's much more clear. Thank you. No worries. All right. So um, let's see. Um, the, is everybody else here just to demo? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So I'm going to go with through the list uh, from top to bottom. So first is Karan. Uh, sweet. Yeah. Okay. So what I've got to do is I've got to stop sharing my screen. And this is the way it works here. First, I'm going to stop.